do the pieces. So this morning we talked about what some of those opportunities are and what they look like in relate regards to the changing landscape of, of Asia and where those changes may impact us most. But this afternoon we're going to look a little bit more around things like uh, preparing our leadership teams and having the readiness in our workforce to tackle some of those challenges. We're also going to look at business transformation and what change actually means and how to energise and enable our workforces. We're going to look at leadership and how best to cultivate and develop uh, cultures and leadership development. So without further ado, I'm not going to get, because we're really behind schedule, I'm not going to get into too many long-winded bios, but if I can invite my esteemed panellists, uh, Sunil Moran, Marco Valley, and Mr. Dewey. Ah, there we are. Thank you. Come and join me on stage. Today, this afternoon's format's a little bit different. We're going to uh, hear from our three experts around a particular piece of work or a transformation that they've done uh, as a bit of a backdrop just to set some framework. And we're going to explore through the eyes of these case studies um, how best to manage that transformational change, how to drive lasting culture change, uh, and how to look at supply chain transformation and what is the exact value that we're looking for, how to seek it, how to make it sustainable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite uh, Samuel Narang up to uh, kick us off and then I'm going to follow with uh, Samuel Marco and Mr. Dewey with each of their case studies as well. Uh, so Samuel Sarang, um, I had the pleasure of, of working with Samuel just less than six months ago at a recent conference in a similar vein. And uh, Samuel currently works with the Kodak business, he's the, uh, the VP of Business Services. But I brought him here on his personal capacity this afternoon because I felt some of the stuff he had been on uh, in the supply chain space, he's been on the shipper side, he's been in various other parts of the business. He's got a great global perspective on how to link those two sides of the agenda together. And so I think when we're looking at transformational change, both the customer end and our operational end, we need to stitch it somewhere in the middle. And I think it's a great theme to, to kick off with that. So I'm going to invite Samuel to come up here and join me and give us a quick framework overview, and then we'll get straight into the market on the so no doubt we're going Surprise? Yeah, Cheetah was surprised. Lunch got taken away. 
right? <laughs> Do you want to be surprised in your business environment like that? You don't want to surprise yourself, your organization, and most importantly, your customers who have been depending on you for so long and suddenly you vanish or become irrelevant, right? So this, this is uh, uh, the learning I take from this video, and this is one of the learning. This, this teaches you a lot of other things. I have used this video in many contexts. Um, that identifying the need for change in your business and in your industry, and take, stepping ahead to be first or uh, implementing the change in time is one key part. And that helps you win half the battle, right? What is the other half? Implementing it right, right? Without implementing, you can't get to where your objectives are. Right? So let, let's look at uh, a quick case study from my past um, where um, we had a business challenge. And um, I'll quickly go through some of the background for this business challenge, uh, and uh, then we'll see what we learned from it on the way and implementing it, and how we uh, succeeded in implementing. Okay. So really, business uh, uh, business challenge was to um, that our customers. It was a computing industry uh, example, and uh, it's a service organization. The service cost was going up. Customer satisfaction was going down. As simple as that, right? It's a big problem to have. And that retards your growth for the business altogether, right? It's not just a service problem, it's an entire business problem. And uh, what was the issue? As we quickly dived into it, we saw um, the incumbents said that, uh, oh, we have done everything we could do. I don't know how to solve the problem, right? Uh, and uh, said we have outsourced the service delivery. It, so that time, around 90s, late 90s, uh, uh, the fat word was, hey, outsource everything. Problem, you want to solve a business problem, outsource, right? That was the name of the game. But we have outsourced it, and still we have such a high cost. And still our customers are not happy, right? There are too many service incidents happening, etc., etc. And when we dived into it, we could very quickly realize um, that the way we have outsourced, it's a how part, right? It's not the what part we did wrong, it's the how part we did wrong. And uh, how we have outsourced, it was not working for each other. Outsource partner and the principal objectives were conflicting. The reason was, uh, you're familiar with the way um, technical services are outsourced today, right? The call centers are not owned by the company. The repair partners who really, uh, people who go and repair your machine are not really employees of the company you bought uh, your systems from. And the way this commercial arrangement was made, uh, we were paying the outsourced partner on a per job and per incident basis which is not very new, right? It's very uh, normal in many of the industries. And this is with the intent of being able to control your costs, right? However, it worked against it. Why? Because outsource partner's incentive was to have more and more incidents, not less and less. Whereas principal's objective was to minimize the incidents to not only contain costs, but improve customer satisfaction. Less breakdowns means a better customer satisfaction with your product, better word of mouth, and you grow your business. And, and to, uh, once we understood that problem, uh, now we have to revamp our outsourcing model. We have to rehash, we have to uh, look at how do we uh, not only uh, change this commercial model, uh, which we chose to be an insurance premium kind of a model that, okay, um, we are selling so many of this thing, you are our partners, we will pay you on per unit sold, not dependent on how many failures, right? And uh, that's how uh, we address the issue, however, the big challenge was how to implement the change, right? And that's the subject today. 
Now, once we uh, do that as any big project, uh, we ran through the pilot and we said, okay, this is the concept, theoretically it looks right that we need to change, this is the way of how you pay to the partners so that they are more motivated to reduce incidents and do the right thing, right? And give us feedback for quality of uh, our products too. Uh, and um, uh, we chose the pilot, luckily we chose the uh, small geography to do the pilot and we drove uh, top down to the country management, country team who was front-ending with the customer to say this is the change we need to make, this is how you do it and just do it, right? And uh, what we achieved out of it, yes, we could prove the concept that it was right, we could really deliver the results in short term, uh, however, we very quickly realized also that if we only do top-down approach, you will not have the, uh, I would say, sustainability of this change. Because quickly enough, the ground level team started coming up with the reasons and started proving the strong in small, small places, right? And, and that's where we quickly learned through the pilot, while we achieved proof of concept and got a go ahead to implement it in large scale, we also learned from that and tweaked our strategy and said um, we will go ahead and work with each of the next country management to not only, not, not just show it as uh, it's a regional initiative or a worldwide initiative coming out now. We spend some time with the key stakeholders, people who can be ambassadors to this change and coach them, help them what is in it for you, what is in it for country, your country, your business, and make them the heroes. And said that, okay, you now drive the change in your country, we are transparent. From all communications point of view, we train them, we um, prepare them and coach them, and they let the change. And that's how um, the whole program got uh, really, really successful, and not just uh, it successfully got implemented this particular project, other divisions also started picking up on it, right? Because at the ground level, we were able to uh, embed the change, get it accepted, get it adopted, right? So it's a long story short, I've tried to uh, summarize this whole case and hope it gives you the message um, that number one, half the battle is won by anticipating and avoiding the surprise. Right. So you have to do it, you, have, you may have small leadership team people who need to continue to look forward. Number two, promote, learn and adapt, not just top down approach, right? And you should continue to be, you walk the talk and continue to learn and adapt. This project, this thing work doesn't mean exactly same formula will work for another project, right? People are different, circumstances are different, markets keep changing too. Help the team get right sponsorship. And that's another thing which we have to do uh, upfront to ensure that, for example, uh, your initiatives and projects need not be just sponsored from your functional head. In fact, I would advocate that you should get to uh, sign up for sponsorship from another functional head who may, who you think may oppose this change. Right? So you again get the uh, upfront big win there. And ultimately, create the right motivation. Right? In my case, in my example, it was by making them ambassador. But you have to see for that particular change what is in it for people who are going to be every day in front of your customer and every day uh, be able to ensure the success of the change. And not only that, but start looking for new change and give you feedback. Okay. Thank you. Well, we're getting the next slide set up. I'd like to invite Marco Giovanni onto the stage. Marco is the Managing Director for Vietnam, Cambodia for Demco. I've asked Marco to come along today because one of the organisations I've seen the leadership programs went through well in the last 12 months in figuring out the framework is the fact of the time to HR. So 
Mark, I know you're going to talk all about Danko, but I'm certainly hoping you can touch on some of the examples. So thanks, Basim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, uh, focus will be primarily on the most important thing we need to do here in emerging markets, such as Vietnam and Cambodia, which are very much fast growth, such as talent management. We have an attrition rate of around 15 to 20 percent a year in both countries, so it is fundamental that we understand how to keep our people engaged, motivated, and how do we give career opportunities for them. Uh, recently, we prepared our strategy 2020, uh, and the first uh, so-called mastery battle or non-negotiable aspect is uh, talent management. If we are not good in uh, retaining our people and uh, growing them in such a dynamic environment, we simply fail. It doesn't matter how good is your product, it doesn't matter how good is your uh, sales capabilities. So I'm going to just now uh, drive you through some of the initiatives that we do, uh, break it down in terms of talent, uh, what are the concepts that we want to apply in, uh, in the way we approach uh, the discussion of talent, how we build the expertise uh, on our people, and of course later on we conclude on, on what is the appeal that uh, Danco has as a 3PM in Vietnam and Cambodia, in other words, why people should work for us rather than for any other competitor who as you well know, uh, Vietnam is fairly crowded from a competitor's point of view. Uh, there's many companies working there, so uh, candidates have uh, a lot of options uh, where to choose in our industry. Uh, of course, there's no right or wrong on talent management, and obviously I'm looking forward to hear your feedback on how to deal with these uh, complicated issues, uh, but very important for us in emerging markets. So let me just go through uh, uh, briefly uh, investment through people. Uh, we conceptualize the talent management in hardware and software. That means on the hardware we are very uh, focusing on creating a, a good working environment where people feel valued and relaxed uh, when they come to work. And also we want to reward high performance. In the mass group there's a very strong performance management where you have objectives and KPI pretty clear for everyone so people know where they stand in the organization. Talent factory is uh, a very important notion. Uh, that means two streams. Uh, we want to be a producer of talent. So by 2017, we want to fill all the position by internal candidates, both in Vietnam and Cambodia, with our local staff. I know this is very ambitious, uh, but if you never start, you really never, never get there. So that's what we're trying to start at the moment. And also, the other notion of talent factory means having a swap of managers not only between Cambodia and Vietnam, and we just did it one uh, last month, but also between different business units within AP Mola Mexic. And this is a very fascinating opportunity because you can have managers from Danco going to Mask Line, vice versa, and also going to Mask Drilling, so to share best practices and, and different approach on the business. So um, the staff feel motivated to remain within the group. There's always learning there. There's always a source of looking forward. Uh, on that uh, path. So talent factory is, is a notion that makes us very much attached to it. Uh, and then international exposure. Uh, you will see when you come to Vietnam, in, in general, the level of English is not as uh, good uh, as Hong Kong and Shanghai. Uh, in general, people are not very much exposed to the big picture outside Vietnam and Cambodia. So what are we going to do? Uh, we try to have some ad hoc projects uh, in Australia, for example, or also in Europe, where we send Vietnamese people there, or Cambodian people there, for two to three months. Uh, the returns are massive. Uh, the staff come back highly motivated, uh, more confident, more knowledgeable, and it also gives us more recognition on that particular host country overseas, could be US, or could be Europe, that Vietnam is an important net supplier of talent uh, overseas. So um, we are trying to do that as much as possible. Uh, we can do more, we can do better, but at least we already have the ball rolling and just recently we have one of our staff being transferred to Myanmar, which is not Europe or US, but still an important uh, growth opportunity outside uh, Vietnam. So that's our take on talent. Uh, just briefly on, on the way we want to build expertise. Uh, the key notion is accountability and engagement. A very important is the first part. Uh, this is the main reason why people are leaving jobs in Vietnam based on our research. Of course, money is always important. People live for salaries. But if there is one point beyond salary that makes people change job, is the visibility of their careers. Where am I going if I do a good job this year or next year? What are the options that you may give to me as an employer? 
And this is easy to say, difficult to do, because uh, making the time to sit in front of your talent and tell them, that's how I see your development in three years, is not the easiest task in the world. But we know that if we don't do it, we fail and people, and people are leaving. So for us, it's very important to create the right accountability and engagement on the staff to do that. The second part is what we call in mass the uh, performance cycle. Uh, just to uh, make it simple, uh, we implemented, particularly this year, a system whereby every quarter uh, between me and the managers and also the layer below, we sit down and we have two different discussions. One discussion is on the performance, so pure number driven, and the other discussion is uh, a company jargon called PDP, such as personal development plan. Where are you in terms of, of your weaknesses? Where are you in terms of your training needs? And what can you do? to become more effective, more professional in the organization as a combination of the training that the company gives to you and what are you going to do to develop yourself. Because the PDP or personal development plan by definition is owned by the individual as I own mine. We do this every quarter. Uh, I think for me it's a very big benefit because uh, a lot of things are happening in three months and uh, at least we don't have the nervousness to sit down in December and to talk about the so-called uh, the elephant in the room, uh, uh, the performance appraisal at year end, where you try to scratch your head. What exactly happened in February? Uh, what happened in March? And uh, did, did, did you remember right? Now, every three months, we sit down, there's an email follow up, so we have a fairly clear view on where we're going to end up this year in terms of the evaluation and the expectation because we already have a number of sessions before. So, this is helping us a lot to uh, become more efficient on these two components. Uh, the rest is pretty much standard. Uh, I don't want to drag too much attention on you. Uh, beside the uh, training need analysis, what does that mean is that we want to make sure that every single dollar we spend on training, and we spend more than $150,000 per year on training, is matched to each single needs presented on each personal, personal development plan. Uh, we try to tailor make training program around that, and we want to have staff feedback on the quality of the training, on the quality of the content and the quality of the provider. So we want to make sure that we optimize uh, the returns as much as possible. Uh, other than that, I don't know if I'm running out of time or not. Uh, Kaizen, this is pretty much standard. Uh, the blue collars, we have a vast population of blue collars. Uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, we have in total around uh, 1,200 people, of which uh, 700 uh, are blue collars. So we have a specific program for them. Uh, to uh, become constantly upskilled and promoted from within. But I would like to conclude uh, my part on, on the last portion, which is the DAMCO appeal, uh, why people should come to work for us. And we are reflecting on this every single week uh, because the market is so dynamic. People come, people go. We have to become very good in managing their attention. So first of all, the talent factory notion, as we discussed before, I think this is a unique that we can offer to candidates to move between business unit within Edmond MS and also uh, within different function in Vietnam and between Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, this is very important. Uh, besides salary, what else are we giving to the people? So-called non-financial reward, training and development, um, job overseas. What are we doing to keep them engaged, to give you a chance to become better in your role, other than the pay, which of course the pay has to be in line with the market, but that is obviously a, a prerequisite. Um, later on, we try to have DAMCO present also in the universities. This is something we started in the last two years, uh, to make sure that uh, we try to have, we have a fairly big footprint in Vietnam, so the job is not that hard, but still the uh, logistic industry is not super sexy. Uh, people in Vietnam think of KPMG and HSBC as the first natural employer where to go to work after the graduation. But now we have the TPP coming in Vietnam, we have the FTA with Europe coming to Vietnam, so more export, more flows, more business, more manufacturing, and hopefully uh, an enhanced image of the logistic industry as a good career option for graduates in Vietnam, and that's what we are trying to promote by having done for the mass group within universities in Ho Chi Minh City and uh, Illinois. Um, and later on, career visibility, we discussed about that. Uh, difficult to do, uh, easy to say, but we are putting effort in giving a clear visibility to our people, especially our talents. Where will you be? What is your destination job in three years if you perform at this level or at another level? 
And the last part is work-life fit. Um, that's something maybe specifically to our company. Um, there's a lot of focus on work-life balance. We change the word into work-life fit because uh, we want to make sure that work and, and personal life fit perfectly. Uh, that means uh, uh, applying lean management techniques, uh, making sure people don't do overtime, and uh, making sure that people can achieve good results uh, in the least number of hours. So that uh, also part of the reason that we have 70% or 75% of our workforce is females, and we have a lot of them with families. So it's very important that we try to keep the overtime under control because they don't have a lot of extra hours to devote uh, to the work. So the wrap up from my side is those are the key initiatives that we try to do to manage talent, to create expertise on the Vietnamese and Cambodian workforce. Um, not easy. Again, we have 20% uh, guarantee attrition rate per year. But if you ask me what success looks like, I think if we can manage to finish one year with a 9% uh, uh, turnover, I think we've done a pretty good job. Considering that also in countries like Cambodia, for example, a lot of people today are leaving, not necessarily to go from Danpo to a competition or to a bank, but to work in their own family business. Uh, because there's a lot of entrepreneurship now going on. And you cannot stop that. Uh, but we can do other things to make them sure that they remain to work with us. Thank you. I just want to say the recent slides. I think there's a lot of obviously very, very good points here. I, I echo some of them. I, I suspect that some of my staff might talk about work life balance after this event. Um, I'm going to invite Mr. Dewey up to talk about it. It's, it's one thing for a big organisation like Demco, AP Model, to have all these programs, but not often do you come across a small business that's able to adopt the same things. I've been working with this organisation now for some time, and um, yeah, I, I want to use the words walk the talk. And I think that you know, some of us who were here last year listened to. Managing Director of Yankee, and just as Ken Co talk about their cultural values, and uh, certainly over the last 12 months of my journey, I've, I've seen plenty of that. And so I think the message is that uh, I hope Mr. Dewey can share with us is that you don't need to just be a, an AP model. That's, that's great if you've got those big systems, you're able to cascade that down. But if you're small to medium sized enterprises, you can be doing the same initiatives, and I think we'll see some, some ideas and thoughts around now as well. So, Mr. Dewey, what do you think to do? Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hope you all have your sumptuous lunch. Good? Yeah. Right. And it's always a challenging uh, after lunch uh, where the alphabet L is lunch. Uh, fast forward, it becomes the alphabet Z. Right. Okay, it's always good to learn, uh, share with people. Uh, case study is always a good approach to share and learn from other organizations. What can keep today behind it? There is a story, right? How we transform from uh, two truck prime mover company to today one of the largest uh, local SME uh, service provider LSP in Singapore, aspiring to move into bigger place, the marketplace globally, and how. Okay, as a family operated company, transform and adopt to allow professionals manage, professionally manage organization and how to succeed from generation one. Right. Allow me to humbly share what we have gone through the journey. 1990 was the founding of the company. I think the Founder is Mr. Ko Yanki. Incidentally, our company also called Yanki. All right, and uh, the snapshot of what has transformed over the years, all right, is captured behind in our video as well in uh, part of our banners itself. All right, I'm going to share with you, uh, all right, how we actually as an organization move on. This is uh, right. There are five initiatives that was adopted and implemented over the last three to four years in reality. Right. First is rebranding exercise, upgrading of technology, especially for SME. Right. We, we don't have the deep pockets like some of the MNCs. Uh, improve HR in our industry logistics, 
as a service provider, human capital is your asset. And you need that to execute and drive and operate your business. And lastly, we look into human capital development, training and development. And as I said, we aspire to go globally. The end state of mind is really when you succeed from Gen 1 to Gen 2 is to ensure there's succession, succession planning in place and business continuity beyond the second generation. What do we do in the rebranding exercise? Right? We focus on internal branding. In most SMC, SME is always most of the time overlooked. What do we do? Right? We get hold of the uh, key stakeholders as well as the HODs, we do a leadership workshop. What do we do to get them to come up with together the vision, the mission, and the eight core values that I may tie today is eight. All right, it's uh, feng shui probably for the organization. Very important because the founder is a traditional Chinese uh, owner, so he believes in feng shui. Right. And that's where we also have to buy in the staff so that they can embrace upon the eight core values, the mission and the vision ahead. Right. Workplace culture, what do we do? Right. The business owners as an SME is very rare to see in an organization cater for staff needs. What do we do as work culture? family kind of environment, right? What do they do? They set up facilities in our admin block because in Singapore, all right, uh, most families is a double uh, income family. The ladies, working mothers, and we don't have uh, many domestic help. What do they do? They can put their child into our childcare corner. So allow them to focus on the work area and not be worried about or oh, I'll be late to the childcare, I'll be fine, I'll be penalized, my child will be you not know, crying. So they adopted that kind of family culture. And how do we cultivate sense of belonging in terms of uh, internal uh, rebranding? Uh, we involve our staff into photo taking of preparing, showing them in our calendars. Why? When they see it, they affiliate with it, they feel that they are part of the organization. And we do have also communicate key messages and strategic plans. Right? Communicating down visions, visions and all the core values. What do we do? Right? We share with them during periodic town halls. My MD can, or at times even uh, uh, the founder, Mr. Ko, also have a dialogue, have a town hall briefing. And Mr. Ko has this very good habit of going down to the downline to the drivers and talk to them and share his vision, share his thoughts, share his, their way of working. He gives suggestions. And that brings the engagement of rebranding Yankee towards the future. All right? And I think uh, we do have a lot of periodic dialogues among all HODs. I think one of our core value is getting people to work as a team, even though we move together. Right. On this part, I think uh, basically we have upgraded a lot of our IT infrastructure and even we go to a point of knowing that we need to improve our IT because why? Uh, the idea was really to actually uh, be an SME, you want to capture information, knowledges, how to retain all this within organization. When staff leave, right, all these are lost. And knowledge transfer. People like me are hired in to do some knowledge transfer of our experience of competency. And uh, we have recently, uh, last year, 
we got our ISO, all right, and we realized that, look, we have SOP, but not able to meet probably the market requirement, or maybe not good enough. So we want to benchmark something better, because it's through all this uh, certification, uh, we can market our service at a higher level, not at the SME, but towards the MNC perspective. Right. I'm going to share a bit more about improving HR. Right. Uh, in Singapore, no one is known that uh, SME don't pay very well to the staff. Right. And the business owner took a very serious view of it. What can they do? Change, revamp the HR processes, things like the compensation and the benefit, so that you can attract talents from the market with experience to bring across and add on to the existing knowledge and competency of the organization. Remap, remap the career path. We do want to show that if you join Yankee, right, there is a path plan ahead for you. And we do spend right certain part of our uh, training budget to develop and nurture staff. And you know in the SME sometimes your job scope is very blurred. So we define clearer scope so that staff be aware of what is expected from them. And we engage learning institutions. What do we do? All right. uh, we have uh, subscribed on to the Earn and Learn program uh, instituted or promote, proposed by the government. And we do conduct classes. We work with the institute to conduct classes in our premises to attract talents. And uh, we also redeploy and hiring professionals uh, across the organization. HR has been in the past in Yankee as administrative function, but today it has moved on to be a more strategic in a role. Uh, we do like what uh, Denver has shared. We do a lot of uh, TND, uh, TND, DNA, to analyze and know what's the needs requirement to bring the organization to its next level. We identify gaps, we subscribe to training. We do also, because of this nature, what we do, we have actually among the senior management form a small group called a reformers, a small group of us to facilitate and train staff. We have our own in-house Yankee Academy. And next. And lastly, right, uh, Singapore is a small country, Little Dog. Yankee is part of the Little Dog, and it's part to internationalize our business, right, by extending the beyond the shore. As I mentioned earlier, right, we collaborate with organization with other people uh, into partnership as well into joint ventures. And uh, when we go into overseas market, I think we want to ensure that our branding, our Yankee trademark, is protected. And uh, lastly, all this leads us to Okay, ultimately, the end state is really to ensure there's a success planning in place, all right? Attract talent, the right people, develop existing resources, right, to key positions, and also to create opportunity in a timely manner and get right place so that the space for opportunity for staff to nurture and grow. Lastly, is to really to ensure that it's a stability in leadership 
and ensure that our services in the Yankee will not be disrupted or interrupted and going on forward to ensure that there is a desired business result. Thank you. Well, I'll just prove one thing, that is that we have all the technology in the world, but we haven't got people and get it work properly. So, thanks guys. Um, I'm going to, uh, I've got a couple, I've got a ton of questions, having had a couple of weeks talking to you guys on and off over the different things, but I'm going to float to the floor. Have you got any questions from the floor that we want to get into right now for the, the next five or six minutes while we still got these three experts? No? Any questions? Your hands up, don't be sure. Okay, um, so now I want to come to you, because we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about the cheetah example, uh, the talent factory, and uh, obviously the internal messaging, but you know, the other three things that I took away. Um, yeah, from your perspective, you, you talked about some of those challenges around transformational change. Uh, how was that best achieved? I mean, where does the executive council sit in, in driving that stakeholder engagement? I think the uh, uh, initial step is always to get executive council and top management on board with the change, need for change and sponsoring that change. Right? However, uh, then they leave it to the leaders uh, like what I was in position, right? Uh, more at a middle management level to implement the change. And uh, that, but their expectation is really to quickly start seeing the needle to be moved. And if they don't see the needle to be moved over time, the projects get killed, right? And, and that, that's what you have to understand, not just when you're driving change, it's not just the market expectation and what you're trying to do for the market, but also your internal dynamics, right? Uh, not just the people who need to implement, as I elaborated on, but absolutely, like Daryl, you asked, uh, uh, how the executive council and top management thinks and where their patients will run out. <laughs> Mark, you, you, you've been in a number of countries across Asia, obviously you're, you're in Vietnam now, but I mean you've been in, in Japan, you've been around the place. Uh, how, you know, how do we create sustainability? Because you know, when you move to your next role, which may or may not be in Vietnam, you pick up you, you move countries when you go somewhere else. How does that change program remain sustainable in the business? What are some of the fundamental elements that, that ensure sustainability of those programs? Well, first of all, I think as a, as a person who changed from country A to country B, you have to also a little bit to change yourself in adapting to different environments. So the way you operate in Japan is different than the way you operate in, in Vietnam. I think in, in, in Vietnam, for example, you, you play to win. It's a high growth country. Uh, the market is growing uh, double digit. In uh, Japan, the recent it was a stagnating environment, so you play to basically defend what you have. That also translates into the leadership behavior uh, that you have. Um, for me, sustainability, uh, I can translate it into when it comes to talent, for example. Um, the best takeaway I have is that you have to make the time for it. So I think if, as a leader of an organization, you show to your people that you already block all the meetings for the next four quarter to specifically talk about talent, I think you're giving a very clear message to the organization that how much talent is important for you. Because you already blocked the meeting in Q1 2016 on that particular day to talk about this particular conversation on, the, on time. And one thing I also want to add on, on the observation you mentioned before, uh, the power of town hall, I think, is uh, great. We do it once every two months in uh, Vietnam and Cambodia. I almost uh, don't send emails anymore. Every two months I sit in front of the staff, uh, PowerPoint, and then we go with the uh, Q&A. And then every question is allowed. There's no stupid question. Every staff has uh, the chance to, to, to voice it. Uh, the other thing we do also to keep the staff engaged, uh, we are not trying to approach the business as the management from the ivory tower top down come and tell you how good it looks like. But it's more like uh, we involve the key uh, leaders on deciding uh, the key elements of our strategy 2020, which we prepare. So I think one of the most motivating questions that you can ask the staff, in my opinion, is very simple is, what do you think? I think if the staff believe that their opinion counts, automatically the engagement goes very, very high. So we do this approach of getting the buy-in. And also every month uh, we pick 20 staff randomly and uh, I have lunch with them. 
uh, everything is on the floor. Uh, sometimes also not very pleasant uh, things, but uh, what I like is that they feel to come to the lunch, uh, they can talk, uh, their views are listened, and action is taken. So that's how we try to build uh, a sustainable environment uh, to some extent. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dewey, I spent a lot of time in Yankee, and for those of you that are based in Singapore going through and you, you have an opportunity, uh, you really have to go and see their facilities. And I, I see a video that's been playing in the back there. Uh, I don't think I've ever been to a logistics warehouse that has a gymnasium, a creche, and all the facilities. It's like going to almost like Google. I know Wayne and I were quite amazed when we walked through it a few months ago. But I want to ask you a little bit about um, the transfer of accountability. So. You've got, you've got a, a, an ownership team that, that genuinely own the business, and, and so they walk the talk and they, they feel passionate about the decisions that they make. But when you go to Yankee, there's a sense that everybody has that accountability to the same message. How important is the internal branding in that, and how important is education in transferring that accountability down to that shop level? I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of time and effort spent on internal branding, I think basically is that uh, uh, when we do all this uh, with a good objective of involving the staff itself, then it becomes very self-accountable. Because we have the buy-in of these people looking at oh, the, the, the business owners of 25 years, right, from a, from a family operated that doesn't really look at the staff itself and you know, doesn't look at beyond the vision, Singapore operated. And the staff will feel, I'm the old staff here. Our, we, our drivers have been with the Yankee for for 20 over years, and average age of them are uh, 50 and above. Okay. And we have also staff that have been uh, with us for as long as 10, 15 years itself. So, changing their mindset of, look, you know, to be account to the owners in the business, buying them in to see the vision, the, the mission, and the eight core values we practice and embrace into their lifestyle, working within the organization. That's how we subtly allow that to happen itself. And uh, by, by having this gym, the staff mess, the canteen, these are things through the internal branding that look, this is a family culture, right? The family culture, family oriented. We respect the individual staff. Yet at the same time, we take care of them and we understand the difficulty that they're going through. That's why Mr. Ko sometimes, the founder himself, goes down and engage in a dialogue with the, with the, with the, with the drivers in the canteen, right? And that's the best place, actually, everybody gathers there. And then immediately, you know, the staff get a uh, feel that, you know, uh, I'm respected, I'm uh, noticed, right? And, you know, then automatically, you know, you, when you do anything, you, you just think of the boss, of the founder, you just, you know, you just be obliged you know, you are obliged to it. And then I think the owners are such that they treasure the staff uh, and remember that, uh, remember appreciate the staff in the manner that, look, at the end of the day, uh, you have family days, gather the family together, right? Uh, time of thanking the family for uh, the family sacrifice when, uh, when the husband's away working itself. These are things that we do, even in, the, in a small manner. And, uh, and you can see that the staff, you know, feel, you know, uh, when I do things, I always remember the goodness, the kindness of the organization. So the good, so good, the good will that you're building up. So I mean, what I'm hearing there is it's less about spending money on policies and more about actually just talking to our staff at the, at the ground level. Um, any questions at this stage? We've got John from the audience range. Right? Got one question over here, Joe. Do we have a microphone there, somebody? Where's our microphone on it? Right behind you. Thanks, Darren. I'm Joe, Joe um, I appreciate very much the, the presentation that were made by the speakers and the, the discussion just now. And clearly, to achieve transformational change in the company, the organization needs leadership, the sponsorship, the huge amount of energy to change, and the buy in from everybody, as uh, Sunil was saying. But too often, that momentum can quite easily erode when you have a change in management, change in leadership, change of staff. And whilst uh, Yang Ki may have staff going back 25 years, in reality today the company's staff level is quite high. And sustain that change can be a problem. What in your view can be done to actually have the sustainability moving forward in the view that our environment is changing so rapidly? 
I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, we did uh, create recently our midterm strategy for Vietnam and Cambodia up to 2020 with four key pillars. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, talent factory and the way we want to prioritize our people as success in our organization. Uh, one of the risks that we foresee uh, of why that strategy may fail is of course uh, uh, because of management stability. We don't know if we will still be there in 2020 to execute this plan. So how we try to offset that risk is that we try to make sure that the strategy we create today is a result of the buy-in of as many staff as possible. So by uh, creating a bottom-up approach, by involving all the team department leader in deciding on what our strategy direction is, they automatically uh, have a very strong um, unity of intent among our workforce to deliver on the objective that we fix. That doesn't mean that there is no risk, but it means that we try to cushion the fact that if management change, the staff is behind, so you have a fairly good reason to have a sustainable project over the next year because the staff buys into and want to execute. Next slide. We're getting a wrap up board here. So one final comment. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just add uh, one quick one and then uh, wrap up comment. Um, my quick uh, way of sustaining the change, even if people change and management change, is to really put more and more emphasis on succession plan, not just management organization chart succession plan, but even processes such as succession and backup plan, right? So if the ownership of processes should not be just one single person, but you need to have people who are backing it up, etc. So that one person changes. And so is that, is that about cascading that back down through and having the ownership that's yeah. down yeah. here? Yeah. It goes into it. Okay, cool. yeah. We've got time for one quick question before I, I get another sign board in front of me. Any other questions from, from the audience? No? Okay. I, I, my, my last question to each of you is, because uh, that's all good and well, but why do people resist change? And we bring them, how do we bring them on board? Yeah. They resist change and they just don't want to be here, what do we do? How do we manage that? Because we all, we've all come across it. Who wants to grab that for someone here? Okay. I'll, I'll start with that. In my example also, we had a huge resistance from the country team because they were the incumbent of who created the initial program, right? And this started. It was really when we sat down with the key stakeholders, and you have to identify the right influence. You may think it's a general uh, resistance coming from the team, but you have to identify the key people who are leading that resistance, right? And who can be influencer in that team. And you have to take one-to-one -one and help them understand what is in it for you for that change, right? And why don't you lead the change instead of imposing change on you, right? That, that's what worked for us. So, so get, get time, understand what the objects are, and reversing that in their own part of the outcome. So for me, just uh, on the interest of time, uh, in one line I can summarize by seeking feedback. I think if you get feedback from the people, you make them accountable, uh, automatically you have a very good chance to bring them on board. And the opposite is true. The more you go back there and say the management has started the future in 2020 looks pink, uh, I'm not so sure how many people are really motivated to, to go the extra mile and deliver much more than the job 9 to 5 that, uh, that is required. So having the humbleness to seek feedback and also tailor made your decision based on the feedback you get. So, so talk less, this is more. So the so yeah, last one, the question. I said, uh, Yankee, we have uh, both uh, drivers that have been uh, 20 years, 25 years, some that have reached 50, and we try to implement uh, apps, you know, uh, tablet that we can do the POV and track them. And, and they, they felt that there's a change and uh, you know, they get resistance. So what we did was, like what, what, uh, what uh, Marco had said, okay, right? We go down feedback. In fact, the, the owner went down directly and hear them, explain to them, uh, uh, explain to them the rationale objective, right? Because when you have a change, uh, people will see from the front end the change impact upon them. But you don't explain to them what's the rationale, here what's their difficulty, why are they resisting it? then whatever you institute the change is not going to be received. And then you don't get a buy and then you don't embrace it. Then whatever you do is totally negated. So once again, talk, listen, 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 communicate and understand. Okay, as you know, that concludes today's session. We've got a push for time. We're going to, uh, please pick up a pause for some real life.